Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next version of the uh, group offer writing workshop for the Masterclass Elite members and also for the Owner Forum members as well. Uh, this one is, it's, oh, look at that. Hey, everybody, this is Charlie Dobbins, and I want to welcome you to the next uh, session, next uh, episode in the Masterclass Elite and the Owner Forum's uh, group offer writing workshop. This one I've entitled, uh, just for a little fun, How to Draft a Letter of Intent in One Hour or Less. Uh, that's really what I'm trying to get you to understand is that you can you can do this in um, less than an hour. Uh, and once you get used to how to do it and what you're looking for, it is not going to be hard to do. You know, I'll tell you something, folks. And I, I love, you know, you, if, if you've been following any of my, my recent uh, presentations, you know that I am uh, taking f uh, flying lessons and I'm getting very close to soloing. But I remember the first time I went up in a plane and I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to be able to master this. There's so much going on. There's just I can't do it now. After 11 hours uh, behind the stick of a Piper Warrior, uh, I'm. I'm able to, I know exactly what needs to be done. I, I do it automatically by repetition. And that's exactly what's going to happen with you just as you go through more and more of these uh, property packages. And it'll make it a lot easier to understand uh, how everything works. So that is my objective with you uh, with these offer writing workshops is to make it easier, make it second nature for you to get started. All right. So uh, as usual, I'm always going to tell you that I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. So get yourself a lawyer. Um, you know, I, I, I'm only licensed in Massachusetts, but all of my students in the master class of the owner form are consulting students. You are not my law clients. Uh, so that is the big difference. And I'm, I'm very, I'm very clear about that. I want everybody, I don't want anybody to come back and say, well, you, you were acting like my lawyer. No. I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. Get a lawyer. Okay, so the property that we're going to be looking at here happens to be in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I used to own property in Lexington, Kentucky. I had some tough goings in Lexington. Um, I can give you my opinions off air about Lexington, uh, but uh, right now we're going to be going through this property, Tarleton Crossing. It's a 124-unit property. So let me uh, jump on over to uh, here for a second. And... Let me just uh, pull up the property package and show you what we've got here. Um, and let me just let it come. Okay, here it is. All right. This is a property from Sperry Van Ness, good brokerage house, uh, obviously a retail brokerage house, which means that this is not an off-market deal. I don't care what they tell you. This is not an off-market deal. Here is the... Uh, welcome center and they're asking 7.385 uh, million uh, my property that I owned was 222 units but a hundred units more than this one and back in 2008 we paid 7.25 million for it so you know ours was a C plus property let's see how this one changes and what the big difference is here between the numbers because that's a pretty big swing um, so here it is uh, SVN Stone Commercial Real Estate is pleased to offer Tarleton Crossing which is distinctive and unique multifamily property conveniently located in a quiet neighborhood setting all right that's a red flag for tough to market because you're not near a busy street while still being close to major arterial streets oh hey I must have fall, taken one of my courses. It provides a quality home for its residents on 9.9 .9 acres with trash degrees, built in 79. My properties were built in the 80s. It's 124 units are in excellent condition with many upgrades, including fully equipped kitchens, spacious floors, ceramic tile floors, ceiling fans, central HVAC, window coverings, blah, 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 washer and dryer hookups in some two bedroom units. Okay. That means we're going to be looking for laundry income uh, somewhere because not all of the units have washer dryer hookups. So we should have um, a laundry room that we can get some income from. It's 220 parking spaces afford additional convenient, uh, convenience for its, uh, for its residents. Extensive capital improvements on a continuing basis, including total roof replacement in all buildings in 20, 2013. No deferred maintenance on the property. No deferred maintenance 
on a 1979 construction property. Property has professional on-site leasing personnel and full-time maintenance staff. Not only is this property stabilized and cash flowing, but there are opportunities for a value add element to enhance future property abilities, which is detailed in the document tab of this website. Okay, uh, I don't think I have that document tab, so we'd have to try to figure out what this guy's uh, value add proposition is to the property. Um, okay, a couple of things jump out at me right here. Built in 79, I don't care what you do to it, it's built in 79. And people that are looking to move into a, uh, a, a nice place will see, no matter what you do it, no, how much, no matter how much lipstick you put on this pig, it was still built in 79. That is something you can never change. Uh, so th that's gonna have a lot to do with the value of this property and what it can support. Okay, now, we're going to come back to this particular page here. This is a very important page to get us started on our uh, cash flow analyzer software. Uh, but one thing I want you to note, he, he's got this thing called minimum rent and maximum rent. I've never seen it listed as minimum and maximum. I've seen it listed as uh, a market rent and scheduled rent. Uh, which tells you what the maximum is available in the market, the, you know, the market rent, that's what we should be charging, versus uh, what we're actually getting on the property. So when we do our analysis, I'm going to use this maximum rent as the gross potential rent, and I'm going to use the minimum rent as the actual scheduled rent that we're collecting for each one of the properties, uh, for each one of the units. So um, that's, you'll, that'll make more sense to you when I get to that particular section. Uh, the deposits, okay, great, they're, they're collecting deposits. That means if you bought this property, you should be getting a check, a uh, security deposit check for $25,400 uh, at the closing table. That's not your money. That's actually, it, it'll begin showing up on your books as a liability. Um, all right, so that is it for this particular section. Um, there's a pretty picture, and as you can see, it truly is in a residential neighborhood, which might not be that good. I mean, look at that. You have to know where you're going to get onto that street. Um, and it might even be a one-way. Look at the uh, cars are parked the same, uh, same direction on both sides of the street. That might be a one-way. Uh, which makes it even harder to get in there. Um, okay, pretty pool, sparkling pool. They're all sparkling. There's that laundry room that we we're talking about with uh, that'll give us some income. Holy cow! Look at that. Looks like it's a golf course. I wonder if there's a golf course right there. Uh, okay, pretty pictures, pretty pictures. Gosh, I've been in over 3,000 apartment units in my career, and they all look the same. I don't even need to look at them, look at them anymore. I don't care what they look like. Uh, as you can see, here's where it's located. Now, if you if you don't know uh, Lexington, this is on Man of War Boulevard. Man of War Boulevard, named after a horse that won a Kentucky Derby. Man of War Boulevard. If you follow it all the way down to the end, it pops out onto. Um, uh, pops out on uh, right at the airport, right at uh, Keeneland, one of the coolest, most beautiful um, uh, horse racing places in the world. Um, you know, you hear about the Kentucky Derby. Uh, Kentucky Derby is like uh, the, the public pool compared to Keeneland. Um, but Man of War is a very nice street. And down in this particular area, there are a lot of very nice apartment complexes uh, that, that exist and are being built in this area. So you got a lot of competition in this particular marketplace. And this one, as you can see where they, where they plop the, the button, uh, that one is a, um, is in a residential neighborhood off of Man of War. It's not even on Man of War. So that I'm, I'm telling you from a marketing standpoint, this property is in a tough location. Okay, scroll down some more, pretty pictures, don't really care. There's the confidentiality and registration agreement. Okay, so that's all they uh, have given us, really, that's it. That's all this package uh, is provided. I think if you go on the website, they're gonna, once you sign the confidentiality, they're gonna give you more information. But let's just go with this and say, like, this is all we have. Uh, and, you know, in addition to this, they've given us the trailing 12 financials, which is very good. Um, uh, and this is what we're going to use to put together our analysis and then determine what our what our price is. Um, as you can see, it's it's all 12 months of the year, which is for 2015. And obviously, we're we're in April, so we're four months. We just finished the first quarter of 2016. So um, you know, we'd want to get that updated information. But we're just going to go with the this information right now, okay? And it comes down to 
right here. Look at this. It's net operating income. That's the number that we're driving for right now. We're saying they're, they're 383. Now, it gives you some wrap up here of total net income um, and also the other items, accounts receivable, security deposits. They just keep track of everything right here. Shows you the total cash flow of 142,000. Um, and then as, as you can see, it's already, they're already paying, they're taking the mortgage payment out of this. So um, this cash flow is net of the mortgage payment. So, but the thing all we care about right here is the NOI, okay? Now, what's the cap rate on this property? What is the cap rate on this property? Can anyone tell me? You should be able to because look at, we all know the formula. The cap rate is the NOI divided by the purchase price. What's the NOI? It's 383,772. Okay, what's the purchase price? What are they asking for? They are asking for 7385. Okay, let's do the math. I got my little trusty calculator right out here. 383,772 divided by 7385, one, two, three equals 5.2 cap. Ooh, ooh. Remember how I told you at the beginning of the conversation about how my property was worth was 7.25 and had 222 units? So that's a real shift in the numbers. 5.2 for a 1979 construction property in Lexington, Kentucky? I'm not buying it. John Brana, I think I know John Brana. I think I've, I've spoken to him before. A very nice guy. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. I have spoken to John before. Very nice man. Um, and this smart guy, too. Look, at this guy's got a CCIM. Best designation you can have uh, in the multifamily business, unless you're a lawyer. Uh, but John's a great guy. And, and I bet you you show this to John and say, John, 5.2 cap on this property. And he will, he'll look at you and just kind of roll his eyes and say, I know this is what the, the seller is trying to get for the property. I don't think the seller is going to get it. So let's get started. We're going to use this page right now while we do our analysis. First thing we're going to do is go over here to the cash flow and analyzer. The guy's looking for seven, uh, seven, three, eight, five, one, two, three. There's a purchase price. We're not going to put any in any initial improvements. Remember, the guy said that everything's taken care of. Closing costs we can uh, put in later. Right now, I'm going to just keep it as a very, very bare bones analysis. If the numbers look good or I can get it where it needs to be, then I'm going to. Um, you know, come back in here and really start to stress the property by making it look more and more like what it would look like if I had to do this deal. All right. So now remember, they set a 5.2 cap. All right. So I'm going to put a 5.2 cap in here. I'm going to leave the 6% in. Now, uh, I'm going to stick it. I'm going to stick with a 25% uh, uh, and a 75% LTV because it's a 1979 construction property. Uh, I'm going to go with an interest rate of about 4.5. And I'm going to keep it, I really should go to three, uh, to a, tw oops, I really should go to a 25-year uh, AM uh, because the property's 1979. Lexington, Kentucky is a good marketplace, and, you know, they're looking at the at these, um, you know, Fannie Mae is not looking at this as a, as a pre-review area. Uh, so you're probably going to get, a, if you were to go and get a government a, uh, paper, uh, agency paper, it would look uh, more like a 20% down with four and a half, maybe 4.3% interest and a 360 year amortization schedule. But here I'm gonna stress the property a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it uh, look a little harder. And let me tell you something, folks. One of the things that we need to understand as multifamily investors is that one of the ways that we make our money, and there are so many different ways to make money in this business, and one of the ways that we make our money is to have our tenants pay down our debt every single month. So if we can do that, we can set this property up so that they pay down more and more of the debt faster, we get a better internal rate of return when we go to sell this property. We get more cash out of the property than we did before. So instead of looking at everything as being, what's the cash on cash return? How much can I pay my investors? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we plow the money back into the property to keep the property as being a very conservatively minded, not over leveraged property? 
So let's stress the property at a 25% down deal and see how that looks. Um, you know, it's not all about getting paid today in this business. You can get paid tomorrow and you'll do just fine. Okay, now, this is where it gets interesting. This is where we're going to jump back and forth between the uh, uh, that other screen right here. Nope, wrong screen. Uh, we've got, what do we got? We've got a studio, uh, 24, one bed, one bath. We have 64 and two bed, 1.5 baths, uh, 36. And then I'm going to use the max rent. So I'm going to use 525, 640, and 795, okay? So I'm going to take this information, and then I'm going to go back over to my cash flow analyzer, and I'm going to put it in right here. So for the studios... Uh, we have 24 of those. That's an awful lot of studios. Uh, I don't care about the square footage right now. We'll figure that out later. And that's 525. All right. Then the next one are one bed, one uh, bath. And we have 64 of those. That's an awful lot of six. Holy cow. $7.3 million for 88 studios and one beds? Wait a minute, hold on a second. If we're doing seven, three, eight, five, one, two, three, divided by 124 units, that's sixty thousand dollars a unit. You can buy a house in Lexington for sixty thousand. And here we're gonna buy all these studios and one bedrooms. This thing's not a deal, folks. I haven't even looked at the numbers. I'm telling you, I don't like this deal. I wouldn't want to own this property. Sorry. Hope I didn't offend anybody, <clears throat> but that's the way I look at it. Two bed, one and a half bath. And we have um, 36 of these, and these are at $795. Okay, now look what happens. Up here in the top line, the potential rental income is 986160 I have a 5% vacancy rate in there, which means that my effective rental income is 936852 All right, now remember, this guy told me that the, that the minimum rents – or what they're scheduled to get are 76420. So 76420 times 12 equals 917,000. Okay, let me explain here what's going on. The difference between this number and this number is called the loss to lease. Add to the loss to lease the physical vacancy, the economic vacancy, the um, uh, physical vacancy, economic vacancy, delinquencies, collections, bad debt, uh, you know, managers' units, all of these things that I call it, and as you've seen in my, my presentations, income reducers, they all go towards reducing the value of this property, reducing the income available in this property. So here between these two, uh, you know, I've got a difference, uh, a considerable difference. Now, what I'm also going to do, but this is just on the loss to lease. This isn't taking into consideration the physical economics, all those things I just named. So I'm going to double this number. I'm going to say that the difference between these two figures is actually more. So what I'm going to do, and just follow me uh, at home, um, I'm going to say that 76,240 or 420, 76,420 times 12 equals that 917. Okay? Now 917 minus the 986 minus 986 160 equals 69,000. So I'm going to double that number just to be conservative here, and I might I might not even be being conservative. So that it's $140,000. So the thing is, the difference that I want to see between the potential, the best case scenario, and what they're actually collecting is $140,000. So in order for that to happen, I'm going to take this $986,000, uh, 160 figure minus 140,000. And I want to show that this property is actually only collecting 846,160. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. What am I talking about? I've got the trailing 12. I've got the trailing 12. What do we have here? Rental income, 812. Holy cow. Hold on a second. Employee concessions. Total rents. Holy cow, folks. I take back what I said. Remember how I said 140 or I was being conservative? I'm not being conservative at all. 812,000 employee concessions. 
807000 is what they actually collected in cash last year. All right, let me show you what that means. When we come back over here to this 986, the property could generate, could generate, if it was being run well. Um, let me just jump back one more time. If it was uh, being run well, and, you know, as I say, if we lived in Never Never Land, and this property got 100% occupancy, everyone paid their rents on time, everybody, uh, no one was vacant, nobody was, uh, nobody was, um, uh, had moved out for 12 months, everyone paid the market rents, this property would generate 986000 You just saw the trailing 12. You just saw the fact that last year they collected $807,000. They collected 807. They went from 986,000 potential down to 807 thousand dollars cash. Big difference. How do we account for that difference right here in the vacancy rate? Now, this is one of the issues. As you, I, if you followed me, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Doug, Doug Rutherford's uh, software kind of lumps all this stuff together, all of the those de bad debt, ec economic base, vacancy, physical vacancy, and we put it all right here in the vacancy rate. So I need to put a vacancy number in here that is going to bring this 936 down to 807. Let's start with 20. Okay, 20 is too much. Let's go to 15. 15 is too little. Let's go to 17. Let's 818. No, we're going to need to keep going down. 18, right there. I'm going to leave it at that for now because that's close enough. 808 versus 807. This property is running at an 18% vacancy rate. Now, do not walk up to the broker and say, hey, this property is running at an 18% vacancy rate because John Brana is going to say, you don't know what you're talking about, kid. And he's right, but the fact of the matter is that from you know this factory is running at a nine at an eighty two percent efficiency number. This property is running at eighty two percent efficiency. It's your job. There's your there's one of your um, value add propositions is to get this property to run better, get it up to ninety. Then you've increased these numbers by eight percent. So that means you know this thing is not a cream puff. This thing is not like, you know, running great. It's a, it, we're losing 18% of the potential every single month. And that explains for like it's a 1979 construction in a very tough marketplace uh, in there because you get a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people that are a lot of nice class A properties going up right there on Man of War. And I think this guy's overpaying for the property. All right, so uh, then what other income do we have? Let's go take a look at uh, our trailing 12 figure. I'm just going to throw these numbers in here. Um, look at pet fee. He's got um, monthly pet rent of $10,000. Wow, that's pretty good. An awful lot of pets. Application fee, that seems okay. Uh, late fee. All right, yeah, I got a lot of fee. What's this 23,000? Wash, water, okay. So right there, folks, water and, trans, and trash. So he bills back to the tenants uh, part of the water and trash bill. All right. Um, Short-term leases, he charges a premium if you're under uh, a year lease. Okay, that's a good thing to do. Uh, laundry income, he makes $14,000 a year there. And miscellaneous income. So all of this extra income I'm going to go let me move my screen over here a little bit uh, all this extra income we're going to add in together so it's got 47,000 uh, 073 plus uh, total operating income we've added that together okay plus the 14,244 and the miscellaneous I'm not going to leave the miscellaneous out of there so we're looking at 61,317 Divide that by 12, and I've got $5,100. So I jump back over here to the cash flow analyzer, and I'm just going to I'm just gonna say other income. We're going to just dump it all together. Now, look, at I'm putting it in as a monthly, okay? And, and I see this number of inputs. I always drop that down to three. It just makes it a little bit more workable. Uh, he's got all of these um, 
it says monthly amount right here. So when you put it in monthly, it's going to automatically calc out for you. Now you realize it doesn't show up anywhere, any, anywhere here. It's going to show up on the cash flow analysis page uh, because what we're dealing with here is, um, you know, uh, at the top of the page, we're dealing strictly with rental income and down the bottom, we're dealing with other income. So that's going to appear correctly in the cash flow analysis section. All right, listen, the income is now done and we've done it correctly. So now we've got a very good picture of what's going on in this property. It's running at 82% efficiency. He's got a lot of other income in there. Uh, and, you know, uh, he's got an awful lot of ones in studio apartments that we're paying almost $60,000 a unit for. Ugh, I don't like that. All right, so let's get over the expenses. This is the fun part. What we're going to do is we're going to take this uh, first expense, payroll, total payroll. He's got down there at 12163. Yeah, that's probably right on the money. Uh, 12163. Come down here, 120, 163. Now, what I'm going to do is you can see I'm not going through each one of these line items. He's got advertising, $8,000. Okay, we're going to put that in there. Um, I'm not going to put in all of the line item, payroll, advertising, auto and travel. Wow. That's a lot for travel. What the heck? As my kids would say, what the heck? What the even heck? I bet you this thing is just going to come out and it's just going to look terrible, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay, contract services. What does he have down here for contract services? $37,000. We're going to put that right in here. Uh, you know, it's typically I don't have anything. I'm just going to put in contract services. Now, you will do this. When you do it, you'll put the ex exact numbers in here. I um, I'm kind of rushing through it because it's all... Uh, I just want to get to the bottom bottom page where we find out what this thing is all about. Insurance, 39.8. Ouch. Now, the problem with this number is, look at it. It's, it's showing a per unit cost of $320 per unit, but that insurance includes all different types of insurance. You see, in this I've got the employee health insurance of 11,000, workers comp of three. These numbers, the health insurance, the workers comp should really be included in payroll, okay? That's one of the issues here. And that's, you know, if you go to build this thing out correctly, you're going to have to make that change because that number is not accurate. You want to make sure that the payroll number ref, uh, properly ref, reflects the payroll costs and the insurance numbers properly reflect the insurance costs. Because what will happen is if you put this in like this and it shows that the, that the insurance costs are running at $320 per unit, and you said, oh, that's ridiculous. I'm going to send it out for bid. And everybody comes back and bids $220. You're like, great, I'm switching my insurance. When you did the analysis wrong, and you end up over, uh, you know, probably getting a, a comparable or, or lesser policy uh, because you didn't do the analysis, and now you end up overpaying for the insurance. You've got to break these numbers down so that they come out uh, so that you know what you're doing and you know what you're buying and you know what everything costs. And let me just stress that um, that is especially true when you see these types of, of, of expenses or income, short term fee lease. You're paying some people are paying more for their units because they're on a month to month basis. Well, does that mean that the rent is, is higher? No, the rent is the same. These people are paying a premium on top of the rent. So, and if you don't break those two numbers out, you'll think that this property is, the rents are too high on this property, and they aren't. So, these are the types of things you need to understand when you're looking at these numbers. Uh, insurance, okay, legal and professional, 3800 bucks. Of course, my, my brethren need to be paid, 3800 bucks. Uh, down here, uh, management fees. Okay, so let's see what they charge for management fees. They're saying 42000 What are we going to charge? If we come over here and we want to put in a five unit, 32000 They said, thir wait, what did they say? They said 42 and we are, let's go to 4%. Yeah, they're charging a 4% property management fee, which is probably right. Let's leave it there. I'm not going to uh, bust this guy too much. The 4% is probably right. 
GNA, general and administrative, is $10,000. So let's put $10,000 in here under uh, general and administrative. I'm just going to type it in here. Um, um, that's okay. So we'll put in 10,000. Oh, and I'm not going to use, I'm not going to go through this too much on the, um, on the rules of thumb, just on, just on those things that are glaringly uh, missing. Total taxes, 60,000. Taxes right down here, property taxes. Now remember, you got to break these things out. I'm, I'm lump, I'm lump summing it under the 60,000. Uh, and over here, you can see they've got the rental tax authority of 3,300. Probably the right thing. 60 is probably the right number. You don't have to break anything out, but you just want to make sure you understand uh, what each thing is costing you. Total utilities, 76,000. Oh, what the heck? What the even heck? That means we're paying the utilities. You notice he didn't re he didn't comment on that in the package, but at $76,000, that might be close to us you know, being an all bills paid property. I'm going to stick $76,000 in here. Well, per unit, $600 divided. Yeah, 50 bucks a unit per year. Jeez, that's not, that's, that's a red flag for me. If this is a, if this property is a, an all bills paid property, uh, you know, this is a, a, a strong C class property. This price is ridiculous. Okay. Then he's got other in here. How much do you have for other? Eighty-three hundred dollars. Let's just let's just put it in there. I want to make sure that this is uh, accurate. Uh, other eighty eighty-six hundred dollars. Put in other miscellaneous eighty-six hundred. Now, take a look at this last part. Capital expenses. He's got all these things down here under the capital expenses. He's actually putting these numbers above the line. $35,000 of capital expenses he's putting above the line. Now, okay, I'm going to include these above the line, and let me explain why. The guy, one of the biggest expenses, $21,000 for flooring. Folks, flooring is not necessarily a capital expense. When you go to do a turn, you might have to replace the carpet. Is that a capital expense or is that an operating expense? It's really an operating expense because some of these, these units, you've got to replace those carpets every time somebody moves out. So has that become a capital expense? No, that's an operating expense. So I'm going to include the $35,000 under repairs and maintenance. Uh, let's see, maintenance, $35,000. And then we go back to here, and that's it. Okay, we're done. We're done. Now we get to see how this deal looks. Look at the expenses work out to be 51% expense ratio. Okay, so I've got a problem with that. And here's what, if, if you were do doing this deal, this is what would be the red flag that you would have to go back out and, and confirm. You would go back to the broker and, and the first question is, who's paying the utilities on this property? The, the owner, the, uh, the, uh, me, or the tenants? And he'll say, oh, they, well, they, they bill back for water and trash. Yeah, that's nice, but what about the gas and electric? Who's paying that? And I can tell you, folks, from my experience in Lexington, Kentucky, if it's a C-class property, it's an all-bills-paid property. And therefore, the owner is paying the utilities. And if the owner is paying the utilities and this thing becomes an all-bills-paid property, a 51% expense ratio doesn't fly. It doesn't fly. And what it means is that we got a lot more expenses in here that we're not accounting for. And the numbers should be, the numbers should be much higher, should be closer to 60% expense ratio. All right, so we're gonna go with his numbers, we're gonna play his game right now, and we're gonna see how the property looks. So let's take another gander here, you ready? And this is where the, the rubber meets the road, my favorite tab on this whole thing, cash flow analysis, click. How'd we do? Look at that debt coverage ratio, 1.15. We're going to buy this property. Not only are we not going to buy it, the bank won't even lend us the money. Bank won't even lend us the money. John, John, John. Cash on cash return, 3%, 3.6, 4.3. You guys excited about this property? Is this a good deal? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So what do we do? 
we jump back over to the to the input data tab and we look at it and we say at a 5.2 cap this property is actually worth 8.1 million dollars and we're looking to buy it at 7385 but it doesn't work i can't buy it i can't even buy it at 7385 the numbers just don't work and i'm putting 25% down I'm I'm not I'm not stressing this property. I'm making this property uh you know run smoothly. And even when I put 25% down the debt coverage ratio is still only 1.15. This deal doesn't work. So what do we do? Well, first off, the, the first thing I'm going to do is change the cap rate. I'm going to get real about this property. This property is not a 5.2 uh, cap. I'm sorry, gents. This is closer to an 8, maybe 8 and a quarter. So I'm going to put in down here eight and a quarter and watch what happens. Watch the number right above it as I hit enter. 5.1. 5.1. At an eight cap, which is what this property should be, this property is worth 5.1. Now let's take a look. 5, 1, 3, 8, 1, 2, 3, divided by 124 units. Now we're looking at $41,000 per door. That is probably more in line with what the market is. Now watch what happens. Want, to, want, want me to prove myself right? I come up here and I change the number to five, one, three, eight, one, two, three. All right, now my number matches up. Now this is something, uh, let me just stop you right here. This is something that I see my students doing all the time. It really bums me out and ticks me off and makes me sad. Listen, this cap rate, you don't match the cap rate up with the number just because it's, you can. The cap rate is set by the market, not by your analysis. Look at here. We're looking at this broker's trying to get this price because he's making up the cap rate. I guarantee you the cap rate is not 5.2. Guarantee you the cap rate is not 5.2. So what you have to know, if you're looking to buy property in this marketplace, you have to know what the cap rate is. is. You're an expert. You're the investor. You're the guy going out to grandma and saying, Grandma, invest with me because I'm an expert in this marketplace. Oh, really, Sonny? What's the cap rate? Oh, geez, I don't know. Well, that's not what you that's not the way you're gonna be. So figure out what the cap rate is and use the market cap rate. So based upon this, the number should be 5.138. Watch what happens when I click the cash flow analysis. Let's see what happens to this deal when this happens. Oh my goodness. 1.65 debt coverage ratio. Are we buying this deal? We certainly could. 13% cash on cash. 14, 15, 16, 17. Is this a good deal at 5.1? Yeah, it is. It is. So what we do now is we jump on over here and we put in the date. We put in the guy's name. This would be John Brana, you know, because remember, this is a letter. We are sending Mr. Brana a letter, and you make it look like a letter. Any town, look at me. Any town, U.S. use use guys. It must have been time. Okay, so this is going to be a uh, letter of intent regarding the purchase of a, of a 124 unit multifamily known as Terrellton whatever property, and I put the address in here. Dear John, this letter is to call the, the oh oh. Your company's name here uh, to acquire the interest in property in the general terms. Okay, seller is the owner of record. We don't know who the seller is, so all we're going to do is say the owner of record. The purchaser, that's us, and or signs. And, and listen, nobody should ever give you a hard time about and or signs. I know some of you guys come from the single family side, and they, they cross out the assigns. Here in the multifamily world, it has to be a signs because you're you don't know you're never going to own the property in the name of the entity that you're actually uh, that that it is today. I mean you're probably going to call this thing Terrellton Woods Commons Apartments LLC. But what happens if you never buy the property? But you already set up the LLC and you paid the money? Nah, that's not how it works. Name of the property, purchase price, no additional debt. Now remember, if we're doing doing an assumption, we'd put in a lot a lot more information here. Earnest money deposit. Here it is. You fill in the blanks. Closing date, 15 days after the expiration of the financing period. 
escrow agent determined by us, title company determined by us, title insurance, all the rules and restrictions, survey, who's paying for it, inspection period, 30 days after the end of the effective date. Well, we're going to define what the effective date uh, is um, in just a moment. Actually, I think we already did. Uh, due diligence information, environmental review, right of entry. This is the long form LOI. And look at, we could fill in all these blanks. You put your company header, uh, really only on the first page. Um, financing period, all right. Uh, we did a little funky thing here with, with this. Um, removal from the market, confidentiality, and then your company name, your company name, and then you have the, the client sign it. Um, schedule, 20, uh, last three years, uh, here's your schedule one. That's it. Fill in the blanks and send it. Now, remember, what you're going to have to do here is you're going to have to call Mr. Brana and say, John, 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 what are you doing to me, pal? Uh, this is not a 5-2 cap property, and you know that, John, right? You know that. Well, 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 no, John, seriously. I mean, I ran the numbers at a 5-2, and I, I'm looking at a 1.15 debt coverage ratio. Yeah, I know, I know. John Braun is a CCIM. He knows the numbers. He knows how these numbers work, and he knows you you can't you can't fake the numbers. If you try to fake the numbers, you're going to lose the property. You just you got to do the numbers the right way, and John knows that. So you need to call John and tell him his baby is ugly. But like they taught me back in the insurance business. Don't tell the guy his, his baby is beautiful. He knows his baby is ugly, and then he'll think you're a liar. Bad advice in the insurance business. Anyway, so that's that's it. That's how you're going to get through a, a, a property package in uh, an hour and do the analysis, and it's going to be like landing a plane after 11 hours. And um, that's really it, folks. I um, hope this was helpful. This will be put up on the uh, on the uh, offer writing workshop, uh, so you can watch it any other time. And uh, remember, you know how to get a hold of me. I'm here to help you. Let me help you through this analysis, and I'll talk to you all soon.